Uh, my name is Adam Blackwell, the Vice President uh, at Development Services Group. And on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, I will be moderating this session titled Hezbollah's Conduct Within Overall Strategy of the Access of Resistance. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism. The views expressed are those of the presenter. Uh, nothing could be more timely than uh, our discussion today on Hezbollah, uh, given the events uh, over the past couple of months. We're delighted that we have with us um, from Istanbul, Turkey, Dr. Masab Al-Alusi, uh, who earned his PhD from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. His expertise lies in the intersection of international relations and Middle East studies, with a particular emphasis on Iraq, Iran, and Shia armed groups. Dr. Al-Alusi is an accomplished author. His book, The Changing Ideology of Hezbollah, published by Palmgrave in 2020, stands as a seminal work in the field, offering a comprehensive analysis of the evolving ideological landscape of this influential organization. Uh, through meticulous research and rigorous analysis, uh, he sheds light on the intricate shifts in Hezbollah's beliefs and strategies over time, contributing significantly to our understanding of this key player in the Middle East. With his expensive knowledge and scholarly contr uh, contributions, uh, Dr. Halusi continues to be a uh, leading voice in academia, shaping discourse and enriching our understanding of the complex political dynamics uh, in the Middle East. I'm sorry for having butchered your name, but I was doing my best. Um, he will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will have 20 minutes for discussion. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to answer your short, concise questions. Over to you, Dr. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, give a talk at the uh, Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center. And I thank uh, uh, Ambassador Adam Blackwell uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I thank as well uh, Professor Mahmoud uh, Jengis for paving the way for this talk. Indeed, the, the, the role of Hezbollah uh, within the strategy of the axis of uh, the resistance is, is very interesting, and it's multifaceted as well. Uh, uh, and, and in order to be concise and in order to be clear as well, I will divide my talk into three main points. The first is the deterrent role, the second is the supportive, and the third is the economic. But before I start with uh, with the with the talk and uh, start talking about these three points or three these three functions, uh, please allow me to mention two very important points. The first one is that the axis of the re of resistance it's it's multifaceted. It's not uh, so cohesive as we might think because we have multiple parties with multiple strategies, uh, probably different goals and and then uh, different conduct, different priorities, then, and different ways for them that they came up. So ideologically speaking, for instance, uh, Hamas is a Sunni group, the others are, are Shia. Uh, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah, they're mainly fighting uh, Israel and uh, others, they're probably like the, the uh, popular mobilization forces, they're fighting the United States and Iraq. So there are these differences and of course, that affects uh, Hezbollah's relation to each of the components. The second point that I would like to mention is that uh, Hezbollah is, uh, is a very secretive organization. It's very difficult sometimes to have an accurate assessment, uh, to have uh, uh, like insider knowledge about uh, domestic politics or at least the internal politics of the group. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to come with an accurate assessment or at least have a very clear picture about the strategies of the group or exactly what it's trying to do. So, uh, and, and of course, in veteran uh, intelligence agencies, they, they were blindsided sometimes. For instance, the CIA and, uh, and uh, Mossad at some point, they did not know about the role of the notorious terrorist Ahmad Mournia and how he was actually playing a very important role within, within Hezbollah for many years. And of course, for scholars, uh, this is even becomes more difficult because this information is, is top secret. So it takes a very long time for many scholars to find out about that. In addition to that, sometimes even when we have some information, it's very difficult to decipher what it exactly means. 
the head of Hezbollah, for instance, Hassan Nasrallah, mentioned in one of his speeches that Hezbollah has 100,000 fighters under its wing. But at the same time, uh, that brings more questions than it brings answers. For instance, how many of them are well-trained? How many of them are part-time? How many of them are full-time? How many of them belong to the Radwan uh, Special Forces? We can only speculate. And as humbling as that is, uh, it's very intriguing as well. But it also affects our assessment of Hezbollah. Now I will talk about the first uh, part, uh, which is the deterrence uh, role that Hezbollah is playing. I think that Hezbollah uh, having a have a deterrent posture vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And that deterrent posture is mainly concerned uh, or at least it would change when there is a massive Israeli attack on Hezbollah, Lebanon in general, or on Iran. In other words, that does not relate to the what's going on to in, in Gaza or what's going on in Iraq. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, popular mobilization forces attacks on U.S. forces or even Yemen. And we can notice that by for instance, statements by Hamas's uh, officials, or at least former officials, such as Khalid Mish'al or uh, Musa Bumazu, that they're calling for more uh, involvement of Hezbollah in the fight. And we can also notice that in the speeches by Hezbollah, or at least Nasrallah, that they're playing currently a supportive role, and they will not engage, or at least they do not seek to engage in a wider conflict with Israel uh, such uh, a conflict that happened in 2006. Now, some might ask, why is that the case then that Hezbollah is engaging in conflict with Israel as we speak? I would reply to that, that first, Hezbollah uh, has uh, an ideology that it needs to uphold. It has political rhetoric. It has, it has legitimacy. Uh, within Lebanon and in the broader Middle East, and it can it cannot stand uh, sit on the sidelines while there is an attack on Hamas and, and Gaza. It has to do something, and this is this something is is, is of a supportive nature, as I will explain later. Uh, second, uh, if we look at Hezbollah's engagement, it, it falls within the rules of the game uh, that both Israel and Hezbollah have established over the years. Yes, the intensity have increased, the frequency have increased as well. Nevertheless, that still falls within the rules of engagement that both uh, uh, both Hamas, uh, I'm sorry, Hezbollah and Israel uh, had for many years. Now you might ask, how is that the case? Well, just look at the, uh, Hezbollah's tools of deterrence, or at least its uh, weapons stockpiles or at least military planning, and you would find out that it has not used a fraction of what it has in the current conflict over the past four months, almost four months, in comparison to the conflict of one month that had happened in 2006. For example, Hezbollah is estimated to have at least 150,000 rockets and missiles, and it has not used many of those. In addition, it has not attacked many deep cities within Israel that uh, Hezbollah can reach through all of these missiles and rockets. The second thing is that through uh, statements and even some of my interviews that I had with some Hezbollah officials many years ago, they had planned to infiltrate into the Galili and uh, probably take some Israeli hostages or at least uh, occupy some of the settlements. Uh, and uh, they would through, do that by the Radwan uh, special forces and through the tunnels that they have built. They have built many years ago. In other words, just think of the Hamas terrorist attack on October seventh as a demo for such a, a, a Hezbollah attack. And Hezbollah, of course, has much many more capabilities than Hamas would have. Finally, uh, another tool that uh, Hezbollah has and it has not used in the current conflict is, of course, terrorism. Hezbollah have, uh, you, has used terrorism, or at least the terrorist operations in 1992 and 1994 in Argentina, and even more recently, in, it tried to do some terrorist operations in Bulgaria, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and other countries too. And we have not seen uh, such attacks, at least included in, in the current conflict. In other words, 
I do not believe that the count the current conflict would widen because of Hamas and, and Gaza. However, if there are some miscal if there's some miscalculation between either Hezbollah and Israel, uh, the conflict could widen. And it's it would be much more related to the uh, dynamics between uh, the dynamics that's going on between Israel and, and, and Hezbollah, not necessarily directed at or, or related to Gaza and Hamas. The second part that I would like to talk about, which is uh, support. Of course, there are there are different types of support, uh, and one of them is the political. For instance. Uh, Hezbollah has a representative uh, in Iraq, uh, Mohammed Kautharani, and his role have been aggrandized ever since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis as well. And uh, after Ismail Qani took over the Quds Force, uh, the Iranian Quds Force, he was frustrated with the Shia militias. He did not speak Arabic. He was not so uh, so knowledgeable about Iraq and, and the politics of Iraq. So what happened is that uh, Kautharani stepped in and he bridged a gap that, that was lacking for, for uh, Ismail uh, Qani. Another personal relationship that's very important is between Nasrallah and Assad or, or Bashar al-Assad. Like his father, Bashar al-Assad have a strong ties to uh, Nasrallah and he have a strong belief in Hezbollah's mission. And of course, uh, uh, he that that personal influ uh, that personal relationship influenced serious foreign policy in Lebanon. So uh, that's that's when it comes to politics. But there is also another general trend, which is the soft power that Hezbollah has. Uh, for instance, uh, you you'll see many of the Shias going to Lebanon. Many probably members of the Shia militias. They're well connected to Hezbollah, and you'll see them in Beirut. And even uh, Al Houthi's TV uh, channel and Masira is airing from Lebanon as well. And I would also venture to say that uh, Hezbollah and uh, the IRGC they also use the holy sites in Iraq to recruit many of the Shias around the world, specifically in the Middle East. Now to the final part, which is uh, oh, oh, sorry. Let me let me uh, add that uh, Hezbollah's uh, support also includes. Uh, supporting the Syrian regime. For instance, they sent about 10,000 fighters uh, to uh, help the regime in its fight against insurgencies. Uh, they also have sent some advisors to Yemen. And Hezbollah, uh, Nasrallah also admitted in one of his speeches that uh, Hezbollah even had some martyrs in, in, in the Yemeni fight against Saudi Arabia. But I think the numbers are very low. It's mostly uh, Hezbollah's role is mostly to help uh, uh, the Houthis uh, in weapon procurement and also in, in training some of the Houthi uh, forces as well. In Iraq, they also played a supportive role by training Shia uh, militia members on the border uh, between Iran and Iraq, uh, within the Iranian side, of course. And some might wonder why would uh, Hezbollah train uh, Shia militias in, in Iran when the IRGC could do that. Well, there was some tension because of the Arab, Arab Persian sensitivities. Uh, some of the Shia, member, Shia militia members complained of, uh, of that. And in addition to that, some of the Shia, Iraqi Shia militia uh, members, they also complained that the IRGC uh, officers were not religious enough. So again, Hezbollah stepped in and start training some of these uh, militias as well. And uh, one of the one of the uh, Hezbollah's officers was also senior officers was caught with uh, the head of Asqab al Haq militia, Qais al Khaz Ali, and I think it was in two thousand and six or two thousand and seven, and he was imprisoned by U.S. forces. And of course, they were training them uh, to plant bombs and etc. And another, another supportive role that uh, Hezbollah did with Kitab, uh, uh, Kitab uh, Hezbollah in, in Iraq is that they trained uh, their electronic armies uh, to go online and post uh, probably positive things or even hack some of the accounts of activists or politicians, etc. 
Uh, now I would turn to the economic part, uh, and I would like to mention uh, also that uh, it's very difficult to assess Hezbollah's budget exactly because, or at least how it would relate to uh, where it's getting in its income. Sometimes it's related to funds by su uh, supporters or sympathizers. Uh, sometimes it's taxation of drug dealers or smugglers. And sometimes as well, it's related to Hezbollah's uh, illegal activities when it comes to drug dealing, etc. However, in a nutshell, we can uh, deduce some of these uh, numbers and figures. Uh, for instance, in uh, from the beginning of or the inception of of, of Hezbollah, uh, Iran supported uh, the group with some estimate between fifty and hundred and fifty million dollars a year. Uh, that was, of, of course, a significant amount of money for an nascent terrorist uh, group. Uh, but some link the Iranian support or the financial support to uh, the oil prices. If the oil prices go up, uh, may, it, so does the funds to Hezbollah and vice versa. Some others, they think that it's much more related to who is in the government in Iran, whether it's the conservatives or the reformists. The reformists, of course, would support Hezbollah financially less. Uh, but regardless of that, there are other institutions that, that could be under the control of uh, the Vali al Faqih Ali Khamenei that would have, uh, that would support Hezbollah financially and without that being reflected in the Iranian budget. In Syria, uh, Hezbollah also has some economic presence and it has uh, cooperated with the Syrian regime as well. Uh, for instance, uh, Lebanon is supposed to have uh, five legal borders, but it has 120, of which Hezbollah controls some, and most certainly taxes other illegal borders, whoever is using that. In addition to that, according to a BBC documentary, uh, there was also a cooperation between Hezbollah and, uh, and uh, the 4th Armored Division that's headed by Bashar al-Assad's brother, uh, Maher, and uh, they cooperate in terms of uh, drug smuggling. Uh, in Iraq, there was a research done by Hisham al-Hashimi who was killed by the Shia uh, militias uh, in Iraq. He estimated that Hezbollah uh, benefited or at least uh, Hezbollah's income from Iraq was approximately $300 million. I'm not sure about the numbers, but they do uh, have economic activities in Iraq. Um, uh, according to some of my sources, they own some restaurants. They also own a lot of exchange uh, places in Iraq. And uh, of course, all of that, if you think about it, if you just look at the general map of the Middle East, Iraq connected uh, to both Iran, Syria, and Lebanon, uh, mostly Iraq and Syria, they're sort of a huge market. Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, they're a huge open market for activities, not only for Hezbollah, but many other Shia militias that they all benefit from it. And I believe at the center of that is Iraq because it's the source of hard currency because of the oil sales and because of the white corruption within the government and, of course, the influence of the Shia militias. So, uh, Hezbollah is part of that and is benefiting uh, other groups as well. I would like to mention one uh, point, uh, which is related to the, the support, uh, and that support because it's much more related to the, the current topic at hand, which is the conflict in Gaza. Uh, Hezbollah also supported uh, Hamas for a long time. They severed relations after the Syrian revolution in 2011. However, in 2017, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah reestablished relations or mended relations, and coincidentally, that happened uh, with the ascendance of Yahya al-Sanwar. Uh, and I think that was part of his overall strategy to reorient Hamas towards the resistance camp. And in addition to that, there is uh, plenty of evidence that Hamas received uh, plenty of support from uh, Hezbollah. And one of them was uh, Israeli complaint in the United Nations that Lebanon, uh, or more specifically Hezbollah, was training thousands of Palestinian militias and also helping them establish a missile factory.
So uh, we'll end here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much again for having me. And I hope that the talk was uh, also beneficial for everybody. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. That was um, very interesting, obviously a very timely uh, topic. I would just like to remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A function uh, in Zoom and we will get to the first one. So um, what is the relationship uh, between the Sadr movement and the Iran-backed resistance groups in Iraq? So uh, right now it's very tense because of the political differences uh, that Sadr has uh, with the resistance, so-called resistance movement. And uh, it, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to uh, say it uh, because the resistance movement as well, there are different factions. So maybe Sadr would have good relations with some and bad relations with others, but I would be much more specific Al Sadr would have bad relations with uh, Qais al Khazali and Al Sa'ad Ahl al Haq because of the uh, history, long history of tension that they had. Uh, Qais al Khazali was part of the Sadr movement. And in addition to that, there are many assassinations and killings that, that are going on in multiple Iraqi provinces as a competition between the Sadr movement and uh, Al Sa'ad Ahl al Haq. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you um, before we get to the next one in Zoom. You mentioned that Hezbollah has something like 150,000, um, I think you said 150,000 rockets. Um, so do these all come from Iran? Where do they come from? How do they procure them? Um, and the financing to buy what seems like um, munitions that would be fit for you know a large army. So uh, I did not allude to the uh, Hezbollah's uh, uh, funding or at least economic activities in other parts of the world. Uh, they have uh, their own businessmen, sympathizers in Africa and parts of South America. Even in the U.S., there were many raids against Hezbollah sympathizers. So all of these, whether they're funding Hezbollah directly out of, out of sympathy or if, if it's uh, Hezbollah's economic activity. I think since the 90s, they tried to be a little bit more economically independent. So this is in terms of uh, their funding. Uh, in terms of weapons, of course, much of it comes from, uh, come from uh, uh, Iran, but they also have established their own networks in terms of getting weapons. And uh, Another factor that's important to the missiles, that the, the stockpile of, of missiles that Hezbollah has, they got some of them from Syria, such as the Scud missiles. And there has been cooperation between Hezbollah and North Korea at some point of time. Unfortunately, we don't have so much information about that. It's still very secretive. Uh, and it's, we just have some pieces of the puzzle. But it's very evident that there is that cooperation. And of course, that's uh, includes uh, getting some missiles from North Korea. And I'm assuming, do they have their own production or their own capability? I mean, you did mention that the borders are relatively open. Um, so, you know, obviously there's no customs checks, but have they developed their own uh, internal capability to produce rockets, arms, drones? It seems like it, at least when it comes to rockets, because... That's that's related to Hezbollah strategy, rockets or at least missile strategy. What they try to do, the the more of course missiles are more precise rockets. They just shoot it over the border. But when it comes to the missile strategy, is that Hezbollah, and this is what they did in two thousand and six, they shoot a barrage of missiles. Let's say approximately uh, seven hundred of them. Now the Iron Dome, the Israeli Iron Dome, it cannot uh, it cannot shoot down all of these rockets and missiles. So Hezbollah benefits from that. Not only because the, maintaining the Iron Dome is very costly, but it's because also because of the system itself. It cannot just focus on seven hundred or hundred or two hundred rockets and missiles at the same time. So I believe they they did focus on 
having their or building up their own rockets. They have this capability. In terms of uh, precise, like missiles, like more precision, I do not have information of that, unfortunately. Hey folks, please answer or enter your questions in the Q and A function um, in Zoom. So here's a, here's one I think that everybody um, you know is curious wants to know, and I, I know we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, how likely is it that Hezbollah will enter into this Hamas Israel um, war? I don't believe they want to enter to to you know in a wider war with Israel. Like this tit for tat that's going on between Israel and Hezbollah, it probably create in, increases that tension, increases that possibility. But the dynamics, this is the dynamics that controls whether uh, a wider conflict would happen or not. It's not related to Gaza or Hamas. It's much more related to the dynamics between uh, Hezbollah and Israel at that moment. And I don't think at least from the uh, Hezbollah side, they do not want to enter a wider conflict. And this is, of course, because of domestic issues. The uh, uh, Lebanese economy is, uh, is shattered since 2009. They've had so many difficulties. There is a political deadlock. There are lots of grievances on the social level. And Hezbollah now is much more integrated within the political system. It's not it's not 1992 or or before or at, at least the 1990s. They're much more integrated within the political system, and the Lebanese society, at least to some extent, views it as part of that part of that system. So they don't want to risk it at that moment. the 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 situation within Lebanon is very fragile. Nevertheless, if their push comes to shove and they feel that they are being cornered and they're forced. I think they would they would see it as inevitable. Okay. Um, here, here's another interesting question from uh, your colleague, Dr. Chingis. Um, Iran-backed militia groups have recently targeted U.S. military bases, and the most recent one killed three U.S. troops and wounded, I think it was forty others, in uh, in Jordan. The U.S. responds with these retaliatory st strikes, uh, like the one that uh, killed uh, Soleimani um, and another of targeting, targeting the leader of Katiba, uh, El Hezbollah in Baghdad. How do you see the U.S. counterterrorism policy um, amongst these militia groups and how what would you recommend for a more effective policy? So uh, it, it, it's really puzzling sometimes, uh, you know, to look at U.S. foreign policy when it comes to Iran sometimes. I, I, I think it's I don't want to sound hawkish, but it seems that it's very soft at times. So if you think about, I'm not, uh, I'm not probably the biggest fan of uh, President Trump, but that assassination of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis really rocked the Iranian government. And if you look at their reaction, it was minimal to nothing. So what that tells me that Iran, if you present some sort of force, and that's not necessarily bombing Iran or the Iranian mainland, or at least killing many of these generals. But for instance, if they target uh, US, uh, if they target uh, some ships, why not targeting some Iranian ships as well, or at least holding them uh, hostages, or at least negotiate with that. Maybe focusing more on the oil being smuggled by Iran, which is for the most part is the lifeline of, of the Iranian government as, as we speak. That's when it comes to Iran. When it comes to Iraq, it's a very fragile situation in, in Iraq because the Iraqi go uh, government is stuck between Iraq and a hard place, between the U.S. that has control of the economic means because it, it's, it's, if it does not release the dollars that it has because of the oil sales and if, if, if it just puts a lot of sanctions on Iraq, then the Iraqi government would be in trouble. And in the Iraqi government, at least some elements in it, they try to be play a mediatory role between the U.S. and these militias that are being controlled by Iran. Simultaneously, when, when the U.S. stumped its foot, again, we, we saw that again, and, and it just applied some pressure, Qahani just traveled. There was a report in, in Reuters, I think, uh, two days ago. Qahani traveled to Iraq, and he just made all of these militias stop. So in other words, 
if you have, if the U.S. applies just a little bit more pressure, and it can be innovative, it can be in mul multiple ways. I think it can get uh, much more than what it's getting in both Iraq and from the Iranian government as well. Uh, interestingly, we just had a briefing here. Um, Cent I'm based in Tampa. And Central Command is in Tampa. We just had a briefing with the uh, with the commander, and uh, he had some interesting insights. Um, Here's another question. According to Israeli military officials, 80% of the projectiles of Hezbollah uh, uh, targeting Israel fall short uh, landed in Lebanon. Do you believe this to be accurate? And uh, if so, does Hezbollah lack advanced precision capabilities? Um, or, or how do you see um, how do you see these the quality of these weapons? I, I do not believe that statement uh, because you just look at the, the the war in 2006 it had tremendous effect on 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 uh, on Israel's north and many I think the number is was exuberant I, I'm guessing I'm not hundred percent sure but it was hundreds of thousands if not more than a million or possibly two like many of the Israelis they moved from the from the north so I I I would I would doubt that very much that Hezbollah does not have that capability. And by the way, that rocket capability is not new. The first time that Hezbollah fired rockets into northern Israel was in 1992. That was over, what, like 30, 30 years ago. So they must have improved that capability tremendously. And, but, and, and, and in 1992, Israel complained about that. And it was affected, like the Kiryat Shmon and other settlements, they were affected by that. So they do have that uh, precision and think whatever you want to think about Nasrallah. I mean, he, he the, the group Hezbollah, they did lots of terrorist attacks. They, uh, they did many horrific things. And I think they have a very negative role in Lebanon. But I think Nasrallah speeches, they have in many instances, lots of credibility. And he built that up, that built up that credibility over many years. And when he says that we can target and, some like the Ben Gurion airport or other ammonia factory in, 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 in Israel. I think there is truth to that. I think they do have lots of precision missiles that can target these these sites. So, uh, you know, if anybody has any questions, please uh, enter them into um, into the uh, Q&A. I guess my question then is, as a follow-up to that last one, is if they're sitting on a stockpile of 150,000 rockets um, and they're not using them now, then when um, and why? I mean, you know, that's a that's a pretty important arsenal to be sitting on and not using it at a at a key. What I, what I would have thought would be uh, an opportunity. So. Uh... First of all, uh, we, uh, I mean, it's hundred estimated 150. I, I would assume it's at least 150, probably much more now, it's because this is, is an estimate and Hezbollah does not, you know, indicate exactly how much it has. So it, it usually indicates more and it's very secretive about, about, about its capabilities because they want to surprise the Israelis when the time is right. Just like in 2006, for instance, they shot. Uh, they 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 targeted a, a an Israeli ship that was used for for spying. So they had a, a, a sea a, a land to sea sea missile. Uh, so they have these other capabilities beside the hundred and fifty thousand. If the hundred and fifty thousand is an accurate number, now what what are they keeping it for? Again, as as I mentioned earlier, they're not they're not using it for 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 the quote unquote the liberation of Palestine or the support of Hamas. I think that ideology have long changed that we will enter the Jerusalem or Al-Quds and uh, we will be victorious and we're gonna liberate it. No, there are many statements by Hezbollah's officials. And I think even like one of them was in 2000 after the Israelis withdrew from Southern Lebanon by Hassan Nasrallah. He's saying that basically I'm paraphrasing here, that we're going to support the Palestinian and their cause, but we will not be liberating a Palestine for the Palestinians. 
And this is an impossible task. It's just reflective of uh, Hezbollah's pragmatic evolution. And, and because it's been for 30 years now, some of its ideology, at least, it's it's it just toned down. It's not as as ideological, I think, as as it was before. So, okay. but, and I'm sorry, just to mention one final point. Of course, it's much more related to uh, these uh, using all of these weapons. Is is if Israel decides to uh, wipe out or at least try to wipe out Hezbollah or attack Iran and Iran's nuclear facilities. I think these are the two main red lines for, for Hezbollah and sort of a green light to engage in a wider conflict with Israel. Okay, so I have two more. I'm going to paraphrase these last two questions. Um, or I'm going to try and combine them, sorry. Um, so Iran wants to be a regional hegemon and is actively engaged in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen uh, with the Houthis. Um, what, what exactly is the goal of the Iranian government? I mean, how do they successfully implement their policies and reach uh, their goals? So uh, Iran's strategy in general, it's they're using ideology and identity for the, their own national interest. It's, it's that simple. So if you look at Iran's at least competitors or adversaries in the region, Saudi Arabia and Israel, these are the two main ones. If you look at the south, they supported the Yemenis, and in the north, they supported supported uh, some militias in Iraq, and they have lots of influence over there. So they're basically pin in Saudi Arabia, geographically speaking, between two the, these two uh, entities. And the same thing now uh, with 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 Israel. You have Hamas in the south and Hezbollah in the north. All of that to protect the regime in in, in Iran. I don't believe there is an ideological overarching goal. Maybe in the 80s when Khomeini believed in this Islamic Ummah and we have to establish one country and all of this ideology. But if you look at Iraq and at least Iraq and, and Hezbollah, they're not talking about Vilayat al-Faqih anymore or establishing an Islamic state. Far from that. They're actually engaging in illegal activities. Some of the Iraqi militias, they're actually engaged in uh, having clubs and selling alcohol and probably controlling the alcohol business, which is supposed to be forbidden in Islam. So it's it's basically supporting all of these groups because it does not have the military means to have a strong military army like Turkey or or Israel or uh, or even investing in uh, in airplanes like Saudi Arabia uh, does. No, they have to support all of these uh, groups for their own benefit. And it's, it goes on the cheap. Like, how much are they supporting the Houthis with? Or the actually, they're benefiting financially from the existence of the popular mobilization forces in Iraq. So, so it's just a, a deterrent, cheap deterrent shield, if you would. Okay. So the last question is, you know, we've talked about the Hezbollah and their rockets, their arms, their financing. So how would you define them? Is it a terrorist organization? Is it a criminal enterprise? Um, and how should how should CENTCOM or or other um uh you know other counterterrorism efforts uh uh weigh in on Hezbollah? So uh the definition of Hezbollah, it escapes many. I think they're, they're in their own category right now. I mean, the traditional the traditional view of these non-state armed groups is that you have terrorists, militias, and insurgencies. Uh, Hezbollah escapes all of that. I mean, but it uses all of these means. for Like I mentioned, they, they can use terrorism. They have this capability, and they've done that before. So... so what is a terrorist group in this instance? Is it just be, just a bunch of fanatics? They try to destroy a specific target and their, their, their numbers is few? Absolutely not, because we look at Hezbollah is definitely capable of using terrorism, but it has much more sophisticated sophisticated capabilities than a terrorist group would. So it's just a, it's its own category. If, if, let, let, we can probably call it a mini state or... Uh, a residue of of a state 
because his, uh, you cannot look at Lebanon right now as, as a functional state. So you have a Hezbollah state within, within the Lebanese state. In terms of uh, how to counter Hezbollah militarily, I think this is not possible anymore because you have an inveterate insurgencies and they've studied insurgencies for a very long time in terms of fighting all of these street wars and hiding in the jungle and hit and run and having all of these capabilities from UAVs to precise missiles. And maybe you'll never know, maybe they got even their own research when it comes to chemical weapons They're in cooperation with the Assad regime. I, why even doubt that? So ha, like addressing the Hezbollah threat is not through military. It could be through finances, definitely. They, I mean, many countries have been lax when it comes to the funding of, of, of Hezbollah, uh, more specifically European countries. Uh, if, you, if the U.S. want to pressure any countries, most certainly in Africa and, and South America, especially those leftist governments that are sympathizers with third world issues or developing world issues that they cooperate with Hezbollah and they allow it to have economic activities. And in addition to that, uh, again, soft power too, like propaganda tools within Lebanon, because Hezbollah relies heavily not on the Lebanese society, but on a specific segment within the Shia community. And that could affect them too. Like if, if there is a, a clear program to target this community. And of course, a more subtle, sophisticated propaganda approach, I think that could that can affect them. These are the two main tools. Of, of course, it needs much more research that I would love to engage in. But uh, yeah, finances and, and, and propaganda. So one, I breaking my own rule here, one, one final question, because I think it's an important one. Um, so does Israel have the capacity to defend against, um, you know, should Hezbollah uh, decide to enter into, into this Hamas-Israel uh, war? Uh, does Israel have the capacity? You mentioned that, you know, the Iron Dome can't shoot out down all of these rockets. So it will depend on the duration of the, of the conflict because Hezbollah can maintain uh, lots of pressure on Israel for a long duration. Unfortunately for Israel, uh, this is going to be a very difficult task to maintain two, uh, two open wars on its borders. It's, it's a very task for any country, actually. So it would create lots of public pressure on the Israeli government. And if that, if that extends for, let's say, two, three months, the public would, would be frustrated. I mean, right now, if you think about it, the Israeli economy lost about 20% of its GDP because of the conflict, mainly in Gaza. If, if Hezbollah enters this conflict, and for a very long duration, the consequences will be devastating. And, and, and even the politics of, of Israel is going to be is, is going to take a, a large blow. And I'm sure you know about these problems that Israel had in terms of forming a government. So it's and it, it's also going to depend on Israeli reaction. So entering into southern Lebanon is going to be very difficult and is going to be very costly materially and, of course, in, in, in uh, human terms as well. But staying on the defensive, it will be better. Eventually, they will have to address, the Israelis will have to address the missiles issue. I think this is the most pressing issue for Israel when it comes to Hezbollah. The Iron Dome, it's a, it's a good start, but it's not enough. Well, uh, Dr. Masab al alusi uh, again, I apologize for um, any pronunciation errors. Uh, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the team here at GTAC for an excellent presentation. Uh, we have recorded it and we will make it available on our website um, shortly. And we look forward to uh, future events like this. And we obviously look forward to keeping in touch with you and uh, uh, and perhaps updating this as events, uh, as events change. So thank you once again on behalf of the group. Thank you so much, Ambassador. It was an absolute pleasure, a pleasure and an honor. Uh, it was a very fascinating uh, to get all of these interesting questions and to discuss uh, this issue. 
And don't worry about misspelling my name. Sometimes I do it myself. Thank you very much. You're more too kind. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for listening in, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.